uh, for the Amputee uh, Coalition of America. I'm really uh, thrilled to have been invited for this. And uh, I think it will be informative for the uh, attendees. And whenever I, I give a talk, I have to say I'm, I'm teaching, I'm, I'm giving something, but, I, but oftentimes I learn something from it too. And actually, I'll, I'll mention even uh, this talk, which I've given uh, related versions before. I've, I've picked things up and published new papers and helped other groups of patients. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and honor to be here. And I think I'll give some interesting, important information. And depending on time, maybe a little bit about Marison Arn Gray. Uh, so that's me uh, from Temple. Um, let me see, sir. Okay. So, so speaking of, I, I, I want to start with the case. It's actually an orthopedic case, but I think it's it, it's relevant. Um, and actually, it's it's uh, talk about uh, get uh, learning something from a talk years and years ago. I was at New Jersey Medical School. And I actually gave a talk to all the therapists. They're all there: the occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech therapist, and um, you never know really who's listening and paying attention. And and years after that talk, one of the occupational therapists, Jackie Jung, who she said. Uh, Dr. Alfred, do you want to see Miss Gonzalez? I was over in the private office, and the OT uh, th uh, therapy gym was near there. I said, Jackie, I'll, I'm happy to see a patient if you want me to, but but then even though it's a common name, it doesn't. I don't sound like it's one of my patients. Certainly not one I sent to you. And she said, It's not your patient. I said, Okay. And she said she's doing great. I said, I'll be glad to go um, affirm or confirm the, how well she's doing. But but you know, why would you want me to talk to her? She said, oh, well, mirror therapy cured her. I said, well, that's something. I said, what'd she have? She's a wrist fracture. I said, what? And actually, there had never been, no one had ever done this before. And Jackie, had, such a good therapist, had picked up a talk I'd given about amputees, stroke, and applied it to, um, uh, to an orthopedic patient. And um, I think I'll mention later on that this can actually um, interact, interface, um, be cross-apply uh, to amputees also. And the case was a 42-year-old uh, housewife, right hand, she, uh, no medical problems, slipped on the ice, and she had distal radius fracture, the, the, the last bone in the wrist. Uh, they cast it twice, it didn't heal. And she had OR, ORIF, that's what we call open reduction terminal fixation. They had to do surgery, they cast it again. And the fracture healed, but when the cast was removed, uh, she had no movement, active or passive. Now, the therapists were great. Uh, and, and also, the problem with this is that when you can't, uh, if you can't move your wrist, your, your hand seems very weak. Like if you ever watch a karate movie, if they bend someone's hand, it, they, they will release immediately like what they're holding because the position of strength in the hand is the wrist and extension are cocked up a little bit. And so the, the therapists work very hard. The occupational therapist, OT, worked very hard to get back her passive range. They could move her. She couldn't move. And I think basically out of desperation, they tried merit therapy. And um, they did it first there with uh, combining electrical sim. Then she, did, then she did it as a home exercise program. And she got nearly full, phys full physiologic active range, almost full range, and she got totally normal function. Before, she wasn't able to pick up her kids. She couldn't take care of her children. After this, she was normal. I thought it was a great case, and, um, and we actually published it um, some years ago. It was one case, just a case, but I was pretty confident in the results, near, near normal range and totally normal function. And it was actually quite gratifying, interesting to see some years later. This little, you don't have to read this slide; it's a complex slide. But there was actually a randomized controlled trial of mirror therapy for this kind of a wrist fracture. And uh, and and they found the same thing. They they use I won't go into the technical details. They use the scale of the uh, of the of the hand function, and basically the people in the mirror group, as opposed to the control group, improved twice as much. And the mirror group almost went to, went to almost completely normal function, which is what I'd seen too. Actually, it's kind of interesting if you look at the authors or at the names or I, I can on the paper you can see where they're from. They're actually from uh, from Iran. So uh, despite our um, embargo, they were able to get this uh, this outstanding study uh, finished. So uh, so that's that's uh, just a nice way to start and as kind of introduction to mirror. We're going to talk about uh, more today, and we're obviously going to focus on phantom limbs. Um, this is a picture, actually, you know, I'm at Temple, we're in Philadelphia, and this is actually from June 2nd and June 3rd, 1863, and this is Gettysburg, and these are the Union troops, and they're doing amputation there. And the question that I, I showed this because the question I asked myself, we, you know, we, we have to never forget, we must long remember the sacrifices of the, of the brave soldiers, you know, who fought there, those who, those who died and those who lived to, to continue fighting the, the Civil War. Um, also, um, 
you know, to really honor their memory and, and also the work that doctors did. Uh, myself and my, my teacher, uh, Professor Ramachandran, Dr. Ramachandran, we always ask ourselves, um, as physicians, as researchers, can we go beyond what they were doing at Gettysburg on you know, July 2nd or July 3rd, July 4th, 1863? And, and I truly believe, and there, there have been numerous studies now supporting this, that, that, that we have made some important advances. And, uh, and, and, and I, th I think that's great. And I think what's interesting is the surgeries were pretty good. They didn't have antibiotics, but often um, infection was a problem, but not always a problem. Uh, and the amputation anatomically knew what to do. Really, a lot of the issues had to do with the pain afterward and function, really my field, rehabilitation medicine. So, so the burden um, is on us, or the responsibility is on us. Um, you know, it's, it's still a, you know, that was 100 and, uh, you know, 60 years ago, 150 years ago. But um, just recently, in, t in uh, November of 2014, President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor to Captain Alonzo Cushing. Uh, for his actions on July 3rd, 1863. And, um, and I think of note uh, also uh, a few, uh, actually a couple months after that, President Obama actually awarded a Medal of Honor to Chief Edward Byers, a United States Navy um, man, for, for his uh, brave acts. What's interesting here is Chief Byers, his, actually his father was a World War II Navy veteran, and he enlisted right out of uh, high school, he was 18, and he started as a corpsman. He was a hospital system basically at a, at a suburb or on the outskirts of Chicago and then after 9-11 he volunteered or tried to enroll in the SEALs etc and then he has you know incredibly brave acts and um, you know defending our country and our freedom and uh, but it's interesting and he, he was a corpsman and apparently even if uh, the reports about the citation even he had heroic acts saving people's lives but then he was also attending to the wounded so I think that's a, a really uh, great inspiration to all of us and, um, uh, you know, as far as amputees and things like that, this, this war is the, the trauma surgeons are excellent, the evacuations are excellent, and, and a lot of the, the burden or the responsibility or privilege of care has fallen on rehabilitation doctors, et cetera. So it's really this war, from a medical point of view, is on our watch, and we have to um, you know, make advances and implement them, uh, provide care, et cetera. Um, so let me, let, let me talk about phantom limbs. Um, there have been, and as we'll see in the next uh, few minutes, we really understand these quite well now through the work of my teacher Ramachandran, some of my work, and we're following his, and then but where people came before him. We understand them quite well now. But really, that wasn't the case even 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, th these are some of the theories people used to have. They said people with phantom limbs, they're crazy. And of course, the phantom limb here is someone's had an amputation. And you still feel like the limb is there. And patients would say this, or, or not patients, people, amputees would say this, and other people would say, you're crazy. Other theories where people say, you're just making it up. Um, some people say it's Freudian. Now, just to um, see, go back for a second, one theory about families was that the people who are saying they got families are crazy. Another is they're making it up. Now, if you're crazy, if it's a psyche, psychiatric or psychological disease, you can't help yourself. The thoughts are, are sort of almost controlling themselves. If you're making it up, it's deliberate. So these two theories, these two ideas are the direct opposite. They both can't be true. That neither is true. Um, one theory is that families were Freudian. That is, they may sound a little silly now, but the Freudians can be pretty clever and they can explain most things. And if you have, um, you know, long thin appendages and you can, et cetera. But, um, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, they they can't quite explain everything, so th this isn't this isn't you know is isn't quite the case. So as um, as resourceful as the Freudians can be, they they really uh, there are a lot of things about phantom limbs that they can't explain. It can be different parts of the body, different shapes. You know, people have to mastectomy, can have a phantom, etc. So so I think this doesn't quite work. Um, uh, so that's not quite a right theory. Or some people just say it's bogus. Now when people say this. I wonder what the it's was. Um, we're going to see in a second. It's really none of these theories are correct. Um, and even Lord Nelson was such a complicated problem. Um, you know, of, of course he, you know, he was one of the uh, Navy, uh, British Navy, you know, helped defeat Napoleon. He he had an upper limb amputee, and, and he had a phantom limb, and, and he there were either there were no theories at the time or his own thoughts. He couldn't think of anything, so he actually attributed the phantom limb to the deity. It was proof of the deity. It was such a complicated thing. And I would say that that surgeons, especially 
Army surgeons have no doubt, and, and of course the patient's been aware of issues of phantom limbs for a time immemorial. Um, and, and let me just mention, on the side of Square Mitchell, he was one of the numerous, countless surgeons at Gettysburg. He was a union. He's from Philadelphia. Went to Jefferson Medical College, um, and there were, you know, there were 30, 40,000 casualties. So there were a lot of casualties, a lot of doctors. Uh, and he did a lot of the original work on phantom limbs or, and, and related topics or, or what was thought original. Um, because we'll actually see Ambr Ambrose Bray, who's a French army surgeon. Um, he had actually done a lot of what Roy Mitchell done, Perret had done previously and published it. Um, he started, actually started as a barber, ended up surgeon to the King of France um, by way of being an army surgeon. And I think that certainly this is uh, phantom limbs and these kind of injuries that have often or they really kind of go uh, with wars, unfortunately. Um, so a lot of the work that Mitchell did really had been done by Prey and also published, but some of these things tend to cycle. And again, that's why I'm a Chandra myself. We try to see if we can begin to go beyond this. John Kersley Mitchell is us, where Mitchell's father. Uh, he's also a physician. He went to Pennsylvania Medical College, now they call it University of Pennsylvania. And he had actually, he was the first, there's something called um, a Charcot foot. We see that in patients today with diabetes. The people with very severe diabetes, their foot can be very deformed. It almost looks like it's got a thousand little fractures. But it turns out that the cause of it is not trauma per se, or the root cause, but it's actually a nerve, it's a nerve injury. Something called proprioception or position sense. And, um, and, and, and it's the nerves are damaged by diabetes. And, or, um, it, that's what we see today. Um, John Kersley Mitchell described it very clever case in the 1831, I think, where a patient had something called Pott's disease. That's tuberculosis in the spine. And somehow it was clever enough to say, well, you've got tuberculosis in the spine, and that's damaging neurons there, and it's affecting nerves in the foot. Or, it's very clever because even, even the appreciation of the spinal cord was really not complete by then. So, so perhaps this, these issues of uh, subtle neurologic problems or neurologic problems affecting things you don't think are neurologic, perhaps it was a topic of discussion at the Mitchell um, uh, dinner table. So let me, before we go on to phantom limbs and mirror therapy and the treatment, I just want to take a, a step or two back. This might seem very basic or even unclear what it, what the relationship is, but, but we'll see in a second it's quite important. And we're actually going to talk about the CAT visual system. You might not think that has anything to do with phantom limbs, but it turns out, uh, in a not indirect way, it actually does. Uh, David Ubel and Torsten Wiesel were both uh, physicians, and they were doing um, research studies uh, in the lab of Vernon Mountcastle at um, Johns Hopkins in the 1950s and 60s, and they were studying the cat visual system. And th what they were doing is they stick a, a little electrode in the cat visual system in the back of the head, and they were flashing things in front of the cat's eyes, and they were trying to see what would get the cells to respond. Because because at the time, there was no knowledge of how you have the stimulus out in the world, vision, touch sound or anything, how that's encoded into signals in the brain. And, and they tried everything. Apparently they tried pornography. I don't know if they tried human pornography or cat pornography, but that didn't excite the cells either. Until one day, one slide they passed up, there was actually a crack in the slide. And the cell, they had a needle in there, and the cell just went crazy when the crack passed through it. Now, being good investigators, they didn't ignore it, and they kept repeating, and that was the case. Whenever a crack in the slide would go past the eyes of the cat, the the electrode um, would go crazy with, with the, the neurons would start firing. And they, they realized that it was, it was an edge detector. And then, um, uh, you know, they published this work and there's been decades of work subsequently, but the idea is that a lot of the visual system has to do with detecting edges because that lets you direct, um, uh, it lets you um, perceive um, directions uh, both at a given place and also what if you're looking, if you imagine looking to a certain place, then in a given direction. So it's, it's a pretty efficient and clever way to do things. And that's one of the principal organizing systems of the visual cortex. Now, they were awarded uh, together one half the Nobel Prize in 1981 for this um, groundbreaking discovery. And when something wins the Nobel Prize, and, and among Nobel Prize winners, there are they're the top of the heap. It's like the Hall of Fame. Some people are like Babe Ruth. They, their presence adds to the Hall. Others get, uh, get benefits from being in the Hall. And, and Yuba and Wiesel are really in that first class. And when you make such an important discovery, even little side lights or what might be problems or loopholes in your theory might be very important too. 
And, and one thing, and one outgrowth of Yubo and Weasel's work and the theories that develop from it is, is that the primate uh, visual cortex, and then people said that all the primate cortex, it was fixed. Once you were an adult, things just couldn't move or change. Why is this followed from the theory? Well, if you have all these edge detectors and all these, you've got, you know, for each, each any direction space, you have an array of cells given directions, edges in, at, that, at that place. It has to be fixed or else um, you couldn't comprehend the world because if it's, if it's changing, you constantly have to recalibrate the, uh, all, all of these cells and that would seem impossible. So the idea is that in the adult uh, brain, especially, uh, you know, primate brain or you know, mammalian brain, it's fixed and things cannot change. Now, of course, now in kids, you know, they develop and things can change, so that's a slight hint that, you know, change is possible, but in adults, it didn't really seem like things changed that much. But then people uh, thought of an experiment. So what if you, and this was actually, they were working on somatosensory, what if you ampute in the touch, if you amputate a finger, so, and they did these experiments on monkeys, um, and certainly, you know, there were, there were issues with monkey experiments, and, you know, I support the appropriate treatment of animals, um, et cetera, um, and these experiments were in the past, but what they did is, imagine if you amputate a finger, say the, the middle finger in a monkey. Now, before you do it, you record from the brain, so it's, the brain is what's called contralateral. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. So if you, if you imagine um, you're touching, uh, someone's touching the monkey's middle finger, and you're recording on the left hand, recording from the right side of their brain, and, and you find, you stick a needle till you find the area in the brain that responds to that finger. And then, okay, and now you amputate that finger. What's going to happen to that brain area? Well, according to the work of Yubo Muzel, what should happen is that brain area should be silent. It's lost its input. That brain area was devoted to that left middle finger. The middle finger is gone. So that area should, in the brain should simply just be silent now. Well, now, nature, I would say nature pours a vacuum. I think uh, the brain of poor is doing nothing. So that, that seems a little bit incredulous, but you've got to test it. And, you, and you want, it, it's hard to believe the brain suddenly falls silent, but you wonder what would it do? And these experiments were eventually performed by Mike Mersnitz, John Cass, Ed Taub, and uh, there have been some um, uh, other, uh, I think the first work was by Mersnitz and Cass, and, Top came later. Anyway, these are, in these experiments, what they did is they, they, were, they put a needle many years later in that same area of the brain, and lo and behold, it wasn't silent, but it was responding to nearby fingers. So now if an investigator touched the index finger or the ring finger, it would respond, the area that formerly responded to the middle finger. So the, that area in the brain has what we call remapped. It, it, it had sought out new input. Now, this is, this is quite remarkable because it was thought impossible. It just didn't happen. It didn't happen in the primate brain in the adult brain, but it had happened. It had sought out new input. And so we're re, or we call what we call now remapped. So this was a gigantic discovery. And it, and it has tremendous consequences. Um, this is actually a, a, a map. This, is, this, was, this map was uh, made uh, by a gentleman, a doctor named Wilder Penfield. He was a Canadian neurosurgeon in the 1930s and 40s. And he made these maps um, in, during epilepsy surgery. Uh, the brain doesn't really feel pain, so you can do the surgery while patients are awake. And during the surgeries, he's looking around for what areas had, had seizure activity or what he could take out. He also wanted to be careful to take, not to take out, take out as little as possible as necessary. And he was trying to see which areas uh, were associated with uh, you know, movement, which part of the body, or touch. And on the, um, on the left side, we have the, the touch uh, map of the brain. It's, it's a strip. It's a linear strip, basically. On the right side, uh, we have movement. And if you notice the slide, you'll see the words in parentheses, that's Haitian Creole. The reason I have that Haitian Creole is I was going to give a talk like this um, some years ago in Haiti after the earthquake. I actually went there with some emergency room medicine colleagues uh, to give, uh, give out mirrors and use mirror therapy for amputees there. And I had a great PowerPoint talk ready, um, even Google Translate at the time, it would translate a little bit and it actually had a microphone function. I was trying to practice remember my middle school French and it was different, try to buff up my accent. Um, we never got to give the, the PowerPoint talk because there was some kind of supposed to be a demonstration which actually never happened. I eventually gave a talk, it was under the mango trees, there weren't any uh, PowerPoint, but it was a, it was a great uh, venue for a talk. 
but in honor of that, in honor of the patients, you know, we, we are helping and trying to help, uh, I, I retain the slide. Um, but if you look, I'd ask you to, to focus on the, the left one, which is the sensory map. And if you see, I don't know if you can see the arrow there, but if you look, um, what's interesting is so, this is a linear map. It's, it's a strip. It's kind of right, it goes from left to right, and it's right behind the, the midline on your, uh, on your scalp, basically, or under your scalp. And, um, and uh, or, or it goes from middle to, the, to one ear and, uh, on each side. And it's, it's, it's a line. Now, the bodies are, are one-dimensional. Uh, uh, the line has one dimension. The body surface is two dimensions. And there's a branch of mathematics called topology. Uh, and so, which has to do with space and uh, transforming things. I mean, you go from one dimension to two dimensions. If you uh, you have to have some jumps, you can't quite do it smoothly, um, uh, especially in a like a biologic or non mathematical setting. So, if if you see here, if you look at this map, the, so it looks like okay, we've got the toes and the body it looks okay, and then the arm, the arm, the forearm, the hand. And always like, oh, there's a big jump to the face. Okay, and also I would say there's another jump here because it goes from the toes to the genitals. Now the toes are not next to the genitals in the body, and the hands not next to the face. But this, these jumps are necessary to accommodate going from this strip, which is one dimension, to the surface of the body, which is two dimensions. Now my teacher uh, in medical school, uh, Professor V. S. Ramachandran, he's an MD, also a PhD researcher. When he read some of the work by Cass and Merzenich and Tao. He thought, well, and this was in monkeys, he thought, well, what would be a really good test for this? He thought, well, if you had an upper, uh, a, a patient with an upper arm amputation, uh, what happens if you, if you, if very clever, uh, if they, if, say they had the hand or the forearm amputated, what if you touched their face? We called in a, a patient, actually met this individual, he had a rather young patient, but had an amputation, called him in, and uh, he took a Q-tip and he, he touched the, the gentleman's face. And he said, "What do you feel, sir?" And the and the patient said, "I feel my face, doctor." And and uh, Rama said, "Do you feel anything else?" And he said, "My God, I feel my hand also." So, and and to Rama, this made a lot of sense. And now to everybody, it does because the hand is next to the face. So what Rama's theory was, and there have been a lot of experiments in, in animals, and there these, if you read about MRI or fMRI or PET scans in people and a lot of other ways you can look at this, um, that, the, that the hand area in the face of an amputation had actually remapped to the face. Now, everybody doesn't have this. Maybe about a third of patients have an orderly remapping uh, of the hand to the face, but, but you see this in patients. Um, sometimes the remapping can be disorderly, shall we say, and you know, instead of just a touch, like a touch neuron in the hand, what was the hand going to the face area, they could get cross-wired maybe with a pain neuron, and that could cause a terrible problem because if you get just a little wisp of air or just a breeze on the face, it caused tremendous pain. So, you know, this, this can go both ways, but, but this was a very strong confirmation of this remapping idea, and also occasionally can have uh, clinical benefits. And actually, when I was in medical school, I got uh, myself, actually, in Rama, a great lunch. Rama said to me one day, he said, Eric, uh, someone wants to take us out to lunch. And so it was a, a businessman, I was at UC, University of California, San Diego, businessman from La Jolla. I went to this very fancy restaurant. I took one look at the menu. I thought, you know, there's nothing I can afford here. And, um, and the gentleman who asked this out, uh, Rama had the same look. He said, no, just get what you want. You know, I'm paying. Um, and then, you know, he was disappointed. At first, we had to order appetizers, order appetizers, dessert, the whole thing. And we talked about, you know, the weather and his business. And he was a very nice guy. And, he actually had an amputation. He'd had a, um, a tumor, a sarcoma in his arm. He had an amputation. Uh, there had been some years before, obviously, he was doing well, so uh, that seemed to be fine. There was no, no cancer. Though, though what's interesting, during, during lunch, he kept, he kept, scratching, his, kept scratching his face um, with his intact arm. But finally, at the end, Rama said to him, you know, why have you invited us here? I mean, we love lunch. It's nice to talk to you. It's great to hear about your business. Um, you're very kind to take us out, but why are you here? He said, you saved my life. Rama said, but we don't even know you. How could we have saved your life? And the gentleman had actually had an itch in his phantom thumb. It was so severe, despite taking all medicines, uh, it persisted to the point where, where he contemplated suicide. 
And then he read about Sonorama's work, and it turns out he was one of the lucky ones to have a map of his of his hand on his face. And and the reason he was scratching his face was he was he was scratching an Hitchens phantom thumb, and this this relieved his problem. So this was kind of a nice application. Sometimes um, uh, you see this. Now this that's on the sensory side, um, but today I'm really going to focus uh, on the uh, on the motor side, um, which is I think even a more generally applicable therapy. Uh, this is also started with uh, Ramachandran. This was his paper in Nature, Touching the Phantom Limb. Uh, it's what we call mirror therapy. And so the idea is this is a, um, it's a picture, that's me. This is a demonstration, a picture here. And the idea is, um, for example, if you, often the, the easiest patients are to, to treat with this, mirror therapy does not work for everybody. It doesn't work for every kind of phantom pain. Uh, you know, phantom pain, like any pain in medicine, comes different types. There can be a burning pain, a burning constant pain. Merotherapy typically does not work for that. But there's, but some patients have a pain of immobility or spasm. Patient, you see the, the pain look on their face. Oh, my, my, my phantom hand is, is clenched up, and um, or it's spasmed up, or it's in it's an unusual position. And we found that the merotherapy can be extremely helpful uh, in this case. And the way you would do it is, um, I'm demonstrating here, but in this case, um, it's the left arm that would be uh, the amputated one. And, and you position the right arm, you see, in the position where you feel the phantom is. And then you look at the mirror, and I'm, notice I'm watching the reflection of my right hand in the mirror. I'm not what I call, quote unquote, cheating. I'm not looking at my actual right hand, I'm looking at the reflection in the mirror. And then the idea is you, for example, if your phantom fin clenches fist, I would clench my right hand. And then I would open my right hand while watching the reflection in the mirror and also try to open the phantom as best I can. <clears throat> and this technique procedure is often extremely um, beneficial for patients. Um, so um, there's a picture there. And uh, there, you know, there are a lot of pictures like this on the web now. And also the next slide, what we're going to show, we'll get to in a second. I actually have a video. Temple um, made a video. Um, they had an article in uh, one of the university magazines about the mirror therapy. And, um, and and they actually made a very good video. Now you know how videos are they don't always they don't always run perfect. So um, if 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 it's not if it, I think there may be a little segmentation. We found a little bit of that. Uh, it's a little sluggish at points. It's just a couple minutes. Uh, we found that in uh, when um, rehearsing uh, the talk. So so don't don't uh, blame us for that. But I think also we'll talk about that's why I think we we like using the regular mirror rather than there. People are talking about virtual reality in some cases of mirror therapy. I've worked on it too, written some grants for it, but, but Rama and I like to say, why well, use virtual reality, we just use reality. So there's a good thing for the regular mirror, but when we go to the next slide, um, we're going to, um, the excellent support, um, Tim from the NPT Coalition is going to help us. We're going we're to see this video, and I think that will help to illustrate things and uh, make clear some of what I'm saying. So uh, right now we're going to, uh, Tim, let's, uh, let's play this video now. Can you bring up the sound or? Moving less than it should because of uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome. And mirror therapy is a tool to uh, increase uh, the movement of the poorly moving line. Healthy people can experience the mirror effect quite easily. What you do is you put one hand on the side of the mirror and you want to look at the reflection of the hand that you can see in the mirror. Don't cheat and look at the real hand, look at the reflection. And the idea is you open and close both fists uh, relatively slowly and, and you do it differently. It's a very strange feeling you get. We have something called proprioception or position sense. We know where our limbs are, even though we can't see them. When we look at the reflection of one hand, say you look at the reflection of your left hand, it looks like your right hand. So the brain gives visual input of a right hand. With patients, we have them move at the same time. And the idea is that the vision of the good hand will help, or, or leg will help the affected arm or leg. You can use mirror therapy with, with objects. If you're having trouble moving the object with, the, in this case, the right hand, you can do it with both hands and use the vision of the reflection of the left hand uh, to help the right hand. It has 
an impact because of natural disasters, wars. There are tens of thousands of amputees in, in many countries. Uh, the patient had an amputation over a leg, and they have what's called a phantom limb. That means the patient feels like they still have the limbs. They had a right uh, arm amputation. They feel like their arm and hand is still there, even though it's not. There have been amputees who have had pain for decades, taking medicine to the point of being comatose. And then they use the mirror and instantly they feel better. Literally from the dawn of medical history, of written medicine, hemiparesis after stroke has been... And a, a number of studies starting with ours showed the benefit of therapy and hemiparesis. So that's fantastic. We have all the patients who have been trying for, for, for a millennia to do so. I think the goal of a physician research is, is to help patients in new treatment where there was where there was none before. Okay. Um, okay, I think I think I'm back talking and let me get to my okay. 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 All right, I think I'm back talking again. Um, yeah, I think that video, it, it's a little segmented, but um, we'll, we'll post the link to the video if you, if you uh, want to watch it. There are a lot of, uh, I think, quite good videos of mirror therapy on the web. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen all of them, but they're all pretty good. Um, and I, I, I just want to say that, you know, nothing helps everybody. Every patient's different. Um, you know, like in any aspect of medicine, you have to see the patient. I think it's one of, actually one of the really nice things about uh, mirror therapy, or remapping for families. It's 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 it used to be this like I said, they're crazy, they're making it up. We don't know. Now it's 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 part of regular medicine. We've got different signs and symptoms. We're really trying to define it and treat, you know, aspects and you know, a lot, a lot of people get treated, some people aren't, we try to figure out something for them. So it's really kind of become like uh, the rest of medicine, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, that it's not some off in some weird unknown corner. Um, but I will emphasize, it doesn't work for everybody. Nothing does in medicine. In particular, we basically find, uh, I'm mostly talking about phantom limbs, like I mentioned some other problems, but, you know, we've always, we've, in theory, but our finding too has been, it's really kind of for movement problems, as it were. Spasming, to, or, or excess movement, or if a, a phantom limb is in a weird position, or unusual position, or painful position, it's helpful for that. So it's mostly a movement thing. Um, we always want to look at other cases, but, those are the best ones. That constant burning pain, mirror therapy, unfortunately, does not work for it. So I would just like to emphasize that. Um, Rama had the first paper for the mirror therapy in Nature. This was a this is a paper, and there have been subsequent. This is by um, uh, Jack Sow and Paul Pasquina. Uh, Jack is a just retired uh, United States Navy uh, captain. Uh, Paul is a requ uh, retired and now required uh, Army colonel. Uh, he's, he's still at, um, at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. This is a study in our, our heroes uh, and heroines. Uh, these were laurel limb amputees. And um, actually, we're doing a study uh, with the folks at Walter Reed for complex orthopedic injuries, not necessarily amputation, but very severe nerve injuries or orthopedic injuries, uh, which, which we think might be similar treatments, might be helpful. They published an outstanding study in New England Journal. This is lower limb amputees. They had three groups. Uh, one group got um, got mirror therapy. One group had basically used a covered mirror. They covered as a control just to cover up the mirror. And the third group, mental visualization. They they tried to move the phantom or tried to visualize the pain going away. And you can see, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but if you look after four weeks, uh, the mirror therapy group, the pain went from pretty significant to almost nothing. Uh, the covered mirror group. Uh, no change, and mental visualization actually got a little bit work, worse. And then they crossed these folks over. So um, about they offered the people in the other two groups a chance to do mirror therapy after four weeks, and um, about two thirds of them took them up on that. And then and they also again after four weeks on mirror therapy, pain went to very minimal. So I think this is a was a very nice study. I've spoken to Walter Reed a couple times. I've met patients uh, who weren't necessarily in this study, um, but who found mirror therapy very helpful. Again, it's more movement thing. I know there was one, uh, one patient there, one of our heroes, a 21-year-old. I think he'd had a uh, lost a limb to an IED, and his problem was he couldn't get to sleep at night because his phantom big toe was stuck in the up position. They tried every medicine, every kind of therapy, nothing worked. They showed him the mirror, and he was able to. Put, what he do is before when he wanted to go to bed, he use the mirror and use it to position to get his toe back into normal or neutral position. And the guy's able to go to sleep. So I think that was, you know, obviously I wish he had a limb, but 
but at least we're able to help with with a significant problem for him. I think that was nice. It's confirmatory of the method in general, and again, it's it's he had a motor problem. In this case, he had a poor movement of his phantom big toe, and the mirror was able to uh, return the, norm, the movement of the phantom toe to normal. Uh, so this is this is quite a nice study, and there have been a lot of other studies since. Um, uh, this was actually, uh, this is just a, not a full study, but a little, that's a little paper, a little letter I wrote from when I, when I went to Haiti. I actually saw a couple patients described here. One person had an amputation only partial of them, sort of a half or two-thirds of, of one finger. And they had trouble using a comb because the phantom wouldn't close, the phantom finger wouldn't clench, and it was sort of hard to use the comb, plus they had trouble moving what was remaining of the finger. This is actually an interesting case of a combination of orthopedic injury and an ampu partial amputation. Mirror therapy was very helpful for this lady. She was actually living in a tent city, basically, outside of a hospital in Port-au-Prince. And a very uh, a tough fighter, you know, things wouldn't keep her down, but this, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't comb her hair because of, of the phantom limb, the phantom finger was a moment. But boy, we showed her a mirror. She was practicing, we were only there for a week, but after a couple of days, she was, she was all set looking good. So I think that's you know that's a nice case again. It's it's a, she had a motor problem, both in the phantom and also the remaining limb. And mirror therapy is quite helpful. Also, she she practiced them. You got to work with these sometimes. Um, let, let me just say um, briefly. I want to I think save time for questions. Talk a little about art, but but there are other things mirror therapy at least related. If it gives people thoughts or think about uh, that, we also think uh, mirror therapy is helpful for in studies of found hemiparesis after stroke. That's a partial or severe paralysis after stroke, and something called reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome. Now that's interesting because that's a syndrome that was really not understood again in the last 20, 30 years. You look at, they actually had a, there were two types, RSD1 and 2, and they had a conference I think in 1990 in Cancun, Mexico. Ram and I were lamented we hadn't been invited to that, but, and, and we read, but we read the, the report document and they said we've made a tremendous advance. Um, RSD doesn't mean anything. And it's poor classification. Now we've reclassified. We have, we've called the complex regional pain syndrome type one and two. And we were thinking, well, you had RSD one and two. Now you got CRPS one or two. There's no change. And in fact, complex regional pain syndrome it just says someone's got pain somewhere. So it's, it's even less specific. So <laughs> what kind of advance was that? But it turns out it's relevant here because much like the um, the phantom pain, a lot of work now, both clinically and in neuroimaging has shown that it, it's actually centrally generated. It's coming from the brain. And, and we think that ultimately the problem is patients are just not moving enough. And, and we thought, well, Mara could help me get them to move the limb more. And I found that helpful clinically, and there have been a lot of case studies published and also some, um, some uh, um, randomized controlled trials too, actually a couple of stroke patients also. So this is another uh, area where Mara might be helpful. Again, it's a motor problem. I, I would say, I mentioned it briefly in the video I showed, you know, these are old problems. Stroke goes back to literally the dawn of, uh, or hemiparesis after stroke, dawn of medical history, history being what we write down. The Edwin Smith Surgical Treatise, it, it they treats all kinds of surgical injuries all over the body, and they've got a section of neurosurgery, basically. They start at the scalp, and they treat it well, and someone's got a hematoma, to, they, could, they, they explain how to suck it out, or pretty much, <coughs> talk to neurosurgeons, they say, yep, that's what we do, it would have worked. Um, but then they finally get to someone who has a, what we call a parenchymal brain injury. It's not a stroke, but the injury, a trauma, uh, a sharp trauma, I guess, to the brain. And he couldn't move because of it on one side of the body. And their prognosis is, I will not treat it. In other words, it's not treatable. So these are old problems. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, again, it's not general ignorance about the brain. In terms of uh, taking out clots, they were doing it in the Stone Age. We, we know that the patient survived because there's a paper in Nature um, 20 years ago. If you look at the skull, it, it's, it's healed. The bone's regrown, so, um, which is quite nice. Uh, and we published, I was the first to publish this for stroke, that's me. Um, and since there have been a, a lot of randomized control trials, this is kind of a, of a conglomeration to stroke, but there are, some of there are trials for phantom, et cetera. So I think it's, it's nice. It's really a, a, a burgeoning field of research also. Uh, this is a stroke, which I won't going to now, but um, there are other effects, what's uh, called hemispatial neglect after stroke, um, but again, mirror therapy uh, has found benefit there, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, and again, if you 
you know, go to the PubMed database or you look, you know, there are a lot of studies. It's important to look at them. Um, a lot of people are writing review articles these days. Um, I'm writing one with one of my students now. Um, and on balance, I think the, the studies are, are quite, uh, you know, positive for me. Again, every patient's different. Nothing works for everybody, but it, it can be quite helpful. I, I think, uh, you know, um, you know, in our, how does, you know, in my experience, in our experience, it's the, uh, as far as amputees go, the, it's most effective in people who can move their phantom at times, um, but they have a pain of spasm or immobility. Patient, if patient might have 10 or 50 spasming episodes a day, it's very painful. Those people will really find the mirror works. You get the mirror, you use it to open the hand in the procedure I illustrate in the picture and the, the video, and often after a few weeks, you had 50 a day, maybe you got 10, it goes, if they lasted for a minute, maybe last for 15 seconds, and it really uh, goes down and down. So I think that everyone doesn't respond the same, but I think we get a good response from this group. Certainly larger studies are needed. Uh, I, I'm aware of some studies that are ongoing, bigger studies to really study this more. We're trying to actually, uh, a colleague in, in England is trying to get to get a database of, of a worldwide database on amputees. Um, to, and, and the therapists really study this, so uh, more studies are needed and they're ongoing, but, but that group, in my experience, tends to be uh, the one that responds the best. How does the mirror work? You know, Rama, I've always thought it was this vision and proprioception thing, um, that the vision of the, the intact arm looks like the, um, like, the, like the phantom arm uh, moving correctly, and movement isn't just moving, it's, it's, a, it's like a loop. You move and then you have feedback that you've moved and at various levels in the brain, uh, like when you get Novocaine at the dentist or Lidocaine to numb you, that's the way that, that chemical, that uh, molecule works, it, it only affects the sensory neurons. Motor neurons, but you try to move your mouth, you don't move it too good because you're lacking the feedback and that can be devastating uh, for your movement. So the idea with the mirror is that you get proper, vi the visual feedback looks like your arm's moving properly, that feeds into the movement loop of the brain area and you can move uh, the phantom. And there's, there was a lot of work by Charles Spence, who's a professor of psychology at uh, Department of Psychology University of Oxford in England, and his students and graduate students and postdocs, and uh, uh, a couple citations here. And, and that, that work uh, confirms this. this that, their work was in normal, healthy undergraduates, but um, you, you kind of have one hand, uh, you can see it in the mirror, the other is behind the mirror, and you, uh, you kind of move the hand uh, left that you can't see. And, and the question is, what does, you know, how does the, what is your perception of the hand you can't see? Is it where it really is, or is it where you it perceives to be because of the reflection of the hand you can see? It turns out vision dominates. And these are very, very careful experiments. And every loophole we could, you could ever think of, and 10 more, uh, uh, Charles and his colleagues went over, and they're very nice experiments. I think very confirmatory of uh, the theories that uh, we always think. It's uh, visual feedback on that. Uh, let me just take a few minutes. Uh, I want to save time for questions, but a few minutes. I just want to mention kind of some nice old art, great art here uh, that has some mirrors in it. And, um, uh, you know, I'm a little bit biased or a lot biased, my, my teacher, but uh, the idea of, of using the mirror the way we do, it's called, we would call it the parasagittal plane. A regular mirror is, you look at just what's called the frontal plane or coronal plane, but parasagittal is kind of on the side in the middle, but not quite. Um, and it turns out, you know, doctors haven't thought of this, uh, scientists haven't thought of this, and, even the great artists took them 500 years to figure this thing out. So let me just go through a couple slides and then we'll take some questions. Uh, this is Arnold Feeney, the Arnold Feeney wedding by Jan Benek. It's at the National Gallery in London, incredible painting, one of the best paintings of all time. We could give 10 lectures on this painting, but I want to focus on that mirror in the back. And you can see that that lets you see the reflection of people who are standing on the other side of the room. It's very clever, there's all sorts of psychologic and neurologic implications. Uh, it's the first, but from our point of view, it's the frontal plane, you're staring at the mirror. Uh, now, if you look, um, this is Petrus Christus uh, from, sorry, that was 1434. We know it because it's Johannes de Eckford Hick. He spoke Latin too, but, <laughs> along with Dutch, but 1434. So 1434, 1449, again, you see the mirror, but it's a frontal plane. This is Caravaggio's Narcissus in the uh, National Gallery of Art in Rome, Art History Museum in Rome. And he, again, it's a clever thing. It's turned upside down, this and that. But you know what? The reflection's in the frontal plane. This is Las Meninas by Velasquez. This is at the Prado. This anchors the Prado the way the Mona Lisa anchors the Louvre. It's a great painting, and you see there in the middle, uh, there is actually Philip the um, the Fourth and his bride um, Mariana, his second wife. 
but again, we see them in the frontal plane. A lot of things this pain is the frontal plane. And this is Van Gogh. It's also the, um, again, you see that mirror in the back frontal plane. Picasso, they're facing each other. Uh, this is an Escher. It's a weird pain. It's an Escher, but it's a frontal plane. So, and actually, again, same thing. Now here, all of these have a mirror. They're in the frontal plane. It's not until Escher's, this is 1946, so over 500 years after Van Eck, and this is actually the mirror therapy setup. If you had to put mirror therapy on a postcard, this is it. And it's, uh, and I can tell you, it's very hard to get all the things in the, in a, in a, even a photo, and Escher's done it. When we have tried to take pictures this week, often have an undergraduate kind of hanging from the chandelier uh, to get, but Escher's got it. So this kind of summarizes things. Um, I have more to say about, about art and also about, um, about uh, other uh, mirror therapy effects, but I think I'm going to stop here for now and take some questions. Um, the first question that um, that uh, was submitted is, uh, do you have any knowledge of an increase in phantom pain after bone lengthening surgery for a very short limb? You know, I, that's an interesting question. I, 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 I've never heard that that happened, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with it, so I, I don't, I've never heard it happen, but I, I can't say definitively or, you know, usually no. So I, I have to say I don't know, but that's something I'll certainly look into. That's an interesting, that's an important question. I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the, the next question is, uh, this person's mother lost both legs, one above knee and one below knee in 1985 from a traumatic accident and has used prosthetics since then. Her phantom pain began years later in 2010 or so. Is there mirror therapy for double limb amputees? The that's a great question. I'm sorry, that's a great question. Give that person a gold star, okay? Well, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, it's actually funny. When I spoke of Walter Reed years ago, that was the first question I got. And so it seems like a hard question. And, um, and the Jack Shaw is such a nice guy. I, was thinking, I looked at him like, how are you, you know, it's almost sandbagging me with this question right off the bat. And he said, no, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I got 50 of them. This is from the IEDs. There are a lot of, you know, our young heroes and heroines with those. Um, I had the answer to that question. When I was in, in medical school, actually, we had done some of the work and we were doing it. And I actually got a call from um, one of the neurology secretaries. She said, Dr. Galasco wants you to see a patient. I said, I'm on a different rotation. And what does he need from me? The guy's incredible. He said, it's mirror therapy. I said, I know, but Dr. Glasgow worked with him. He, he knows what I know. He knows much more than I do. And the secretary said, he said, to tell you it's a double amputee in the VA waiting room. So, okay, I ran over there. I had a mirror. And um, the patient was a double amputee. And I think similarly to what you're saying, one was above, above the knee, one below the knee. Uh, the pain was more in one leg than the other, the phantom pain or, the, or some immobility. So what I did was... Um, I, I kind of draped myself or my leg on the side of the, so like on the on the side I stood sort of on the side where they had less pain, like the 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 phantom with less pain, and then I I had them I had the patient if you can follow this they watched it so let's say you've got uh say the right you've got your double amputee but there's more phantom pain say a lot more to make this case easy in the right. Uh, phantom leg. The left leg moves pretty good and doesn't have that much phantom pain. So what you can do is I, I sort of drape my leg over the patient's and I move my leg and sort of in uh, sort of standing in the position of the patient and I had the patient watch reflection of my left leg while they tried to move their right phantom and they found that pretty helpful. So um, and that was just one, not even a case aid, that was sort of 10 minutes in the VA waiting room. Um, I mentioned that, and actually Jack has actually, they published, um, I forget the exact citation, you can search it though, uh, Jack Shaw or TSAO, they actually did, a, a, I think, a randomized study of, of this, basically the therapist, um, you watch the therapist like for a double amputee, and they found it quite helpful, so, um, you know, in the right case, so, so that's kind of the way you do it. Now, I, we kind of joke about the virtual reality, but double amputees would be a, a case where you might want to try virtual reality too, I've written those grants, and you know, that stuff's ongoing, but I think, but you, if you have a therapist or family member, friend, um, that is the way uh, this, you can do it. I had found it effective just one brief case, but, you know, Jack's paper shows it, so I think that's the, that's a very, very good question, and I think that that is, uh, that's, that's my answer to that. 
The next question is, have you researched graded motor imagery? Um, you know, I, I, there's, you know, there's stuff on the web. I mean, there's some papers published. I've seen it. Um, you know, certainly there are studies there. You can read them. Uh, personally, I'm skeptical. Okay, Ron is skeptical. And, and I think, first of all, I, I, I don't think it works. And certainly, if, if every patient's different, there may be patients, individual or groups of patients for whom it works. And if it does, that's great. And I want to hear about it, and you know, maybe you can add some error. That maybe there are groups we don't know. I mean, every other, you know, if you got a headache, you got cancer, you got, you know, blood pressure. There, there are seven thousand different subtypes, and they all have different treatments. And and I think it would be great if phantom or neuro can evolve to that. I don't. I I'm very skeptical, uh, for the following reasons. First of all, um, uh, Theoretically, the idea is you kind of think about it or you imagine or something that helps it move or I don't know or something rather really like that. Um, the the problem with that is <laughs> um, it's pretty hard to do. You can't concentrate on anything for more than two seconds. So I, I don't see it happening. And people say, oh, you know, I was running a race in high school and I visualized before or after or during or something or other that I won the race or something. I, I, I mean, I, you maybe would have run one anyway. Also. Even if that's true, what you're visualizing there is somehow that you just relax. Probably, uh, you you know you, you relax your muscles, and that's you're visualizing basically one thing. And maybe the body kicks off. You think you're relaxing, and the hormones go off, and sort of the rest of the body relaxes. And that might I I am skeptical of that, but that might happen. The problem it's not going to work for the limbs, be, because um, that's only one bit of information. The limbs, there's a million to get you know. Or, billions, uh, you know, to look at the limb and get it to move. And that's what's great about the mirror therapy is half the primate brain is devoted to vision. And we need it because there's so many pixels of information, so many bits and bytes of information. And, and with the mirror therapy, the vision, you get that. With the imagery, you just get a couple. You can think of one or two things. So I'm, I'm skeptical theoretically. Um, also, you know, we, I don't think we'd be here. You wouldn't need mirror therapy if, if that worked. They, you know, the Greeks, whatever, the Egyptians, they were clever, were clever visualizing. We visualize our problems away. If that worked, I don't think we would um, we would be here. Um, but that's theoretically. Now, uh, I think the, 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 you know, the, the Walter Reed State New England Journal, it proved it. That was one of, they had, uh, there were three groups. There was mirror, covered mirror, which is kind of a typical control for mirror, and they had mental visualization. It didn't work. Pain even got worse. Now maybe you could say, well, it wasn't the right grade imagery. I, I don't know. I am I am skeptical. Certainly, if patients find it helpful, or therapists, you know, that's that's fantastic. I support it. I want to learn more. I I I don't think so. Mirror is really easy to use, and uh, and it carries so much information. It, it it's like a you know it's like a full, you know, you know one of these fancy iPod screens versus one little bit of information. So that's why theoretically, and also I really haven't seen studies. Uh, that that really show its use. Also, it's 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 a lot of work to keep all visualizing. So I, I I don't. My impression is is no, but but I'm certainly open to future research. Uh, the next question is: Is there a recommended frequency or duration of mirror therapy? Is it only when they are experiencing pain, or can it be used to prevent pain as well? That's a great question. So you got great questions here. Um, okay, I, I think um, it, it depends on the on the case. Now, the, the, let, me, let me break it down by the upper and lower limbs. The upper limbs we kind of always use more, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure why, or we worked with more in research. And the upper limb, we, the cases we present us are like the spasming hand. And basically, we tell people, and these are people, the, the one where it's most effective is where they can move their phantom sometimes, but it spasms. And we tell them, when you get the spasm, you know, try, you know, deploy the mirror and open up your hand. And they usually find it effective and, you know, Things tend to get better if they use it. Uh, so, so with the spasming hand, that's the kind of thing I'd suggest. If it's if it's a sluggish or malposition, you may need to kind of exercise. We think about you know 15 minutes once or twice a day, five six days a week, um, or at least I say that if you if you do half of that, it's pretty good. You know, my high school coach would say. Um, so that's I would say for the upper limbs. The lower limb, it's interesting, what the therapist, and I've seen, I saw this in some papers or hinted, and then I saw our own therapist do it. They just have patients even, you know, some patients say I don't have any pain, or if I do I don't worry about it, or I don't know, it's phantom limb stuff for you. But patients have, you know, uh, symptomatic phantom pain. What the therapists do in the lower limb amputees, even acutely right after, is, is they have them kind of march through exercises. So you do, even below the knees, you, you set up the mirror, as, as I showed, you do, you know, hip flexion, you know, up and down, 
uh, with the hip. Now, of course, that's intact, but then you do knee extension and knee flexion with the intact leg, watching the mirror, and then you do ankle, what we call dorsal flexion, plantar flexion, up and down, or, or you slide it on the floor back and forth. So you trot through your exercises in the lower limb while you're sitting, uh, you know, watching the mirror and, and using, moving the fan as best you can. And, and that's in people who sort of they say, yeah, you know, I have pain, you know, sort of have pain, uh, not these acute spasms, but kind of the fan pain is bothering. So in the lower limb, some, if they don't have pain, we won't do it. But if they're having, you know, a certain amount of pain during the day, we will uh, start using the mirror, basically have them go through their paces, forgive the pun, and that seems to be pretty effective in a lot of people. And the upper, it's it's more we take the cue from the uh, from the symptoms of positioning when to use it. But I think this is also the optimal schedules for you know for still for ongoing research. But that's that's what we do. I found it pretty helpful. Is there any data on whether a mirror with a frame or without a frame is more effective? Um, I don't know if there's specific data. We haven't really found a difference. Um, what I would say, or, or also if you look, you know, the thing about science is you know it's working, not that you get to work with some guy across the world who's never heard of you or I guess that's a doctor or, or a researcher or, or sometimes your worst quote-unquote research, quote-unquote enemy. Uh, you, you know, everyone uses different things. We've used just um, mirrors without frames, you know, whatever we have available or was ever cheapest, you know, and never really had a problem. People with these fancy boxes, We've never really thought because you know, Rama originally had a box, and you know, we've never really seen the need for it. So I think a regular mirror works just fine. You know, even a plastic one or or one where you know a non, you know, we don't want people to break with the glass. Uh, we, I haven't seen a difference, but some patients it may accommodate to their home, so it may depend. But I would say whatever works for you, uh, we have found, or if you look at studies, because you know there are all these studies and they're not using the same mirror, which again leads me to believe it's not mirror specific, which is nice. Um, so I don't think it makes a difference. Whatever is best for you. I think we have time for a couple more questions, and before I, I read them to you, um, I wanted to ask if, um, Doctor, if you'd be willing to, for the, there's a, a number of remaining questions, um, if we could respond with answers uh, in an email later. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll, I'll respond to them, yeah, or we'll call or something, yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, the next question is, is the therapy for the rest of a person's life, lifetime, or is it something that works to rewire the brain and relieve the pain long term? It's a good question. It depends on the symptoms. We've certainly seen people, especially the spasming hands, it kind of goes away. We saw a patient years ago, it's a long story, but he had cancer and the spasming, you know, and nothing was working. He came to us, he thought he was supposed to get acupuncture, I told him to marry, he thought we were crazy, we showed him the mirror. Anyway. And and he started using these you know sort of fifty a day and he started using it and and then we called him he says you know it's, now it's ten a day last a quarter of the time and he never followed up and finally I called him and he didn't answer and we called the surgeon and he said oh the guy called me and said I have no more pain I don't want to see a doctor so it depends often we see it it sort of it, it gets better you don't need it anymore uh, you know especially if there were things to provoke it um, you know but but everyone you know some patients may need like. Um, you know, it's like your uh, you know water pill. If you kind of have some fluid over, like take some. I don't know. So it, it really depends. We've often seen some people. It's somehow the pain. We we don't really understand why it kind of goes away. You don't need it anymore. So it really varies. Um, but you're not. You don't necessarily have to do it forever. Only while there's symptoms. Okay. And the last question is: um, Will mirror therapy help these electric shock type pains in residual limbs? No, I usually have not found that it works. Okay, because it's it's you know we, we think it's a movement thing, and I just never found it helpful for that. But you know it doesn't stop us from trying. You say okay, we use a mirror. We're gonna you could have say we're gonna stroke the good hand and look at it. I mean, you know I, I want to work on that kind of help that kind of pain as much as anybody. And um, you know if someone has a, a clever scheme or combination, you know I'd like to hear about it. I haven't typically found it works for that. Um, I don't. I think it's worth trying. You know, if you think it might, or you say, "Well, I got movement. I'll try that." You know, a lot of medicine is kind of trial therapy. You got it. If you have a headache, try this. It doesn't. You know, try Tylenol. It doesn't work. Try aspirin. You know, blood pressure. Honestly, it's the same thing. Even cancer. Frankly, they try one and try the other. So I think it might be worth trying if you're interested. But I just, it's very frustrating. It really, I haven't found it works for that. But maybe there's some better combination or modification. We just haven't been clever enough to think about it. I wish. I wish we have her well. I wish we can one day. 
Okay, I guess um, we're about out of time. Um, we'll respond to the remaining questions uh, via email. Um, I just wanted to th uh, thank Dr. Altschuler. I'm sorry, I'm very bad pronunciation here. You got it. Uh, uh, for uh, do doing this presentation for us. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge on this topic. Yeah, no, and I'd like to hear, you know, we always learn something, you learn, patients know the most, so if patients have something, you can email me, you know, eric.altrill or temple.edu, please email me if you have ideas or things that worked or didn't work, you know, I'd be happy to hear about them. I can't treat someone I don't see, but certainly if you're in the Philadelphia area, we take most insurances, so I'm happy to see people, uh, or, you know, or, or, or doctors or therapists want to contact me, that would be great too. And I want I want to thank Sue and the ABC Coalition for inviting me, it's an honor and privilege to be here. In this webinar, and hopefully, you know, we're helping people out and we'll continue to do so. Thank you very much.